All right, there we go. How's everybody doing today? Doing well, thanks. Happy Friday. Welcome to the big MML event. So just so people don't feel excluded, we had a, a great um, operating company only event last time in March. So we invited uh, just uh, construction, industrial, manufacturing, distribution companies out where they could connect. Shh. There we go. I'm always waiting for somebody to go, did he just shush me? Uh, great time for those companies to connect, you know, uh, operating company owner to operating company owner. So uh, it was a good event. Don't want to leave anybody out. Uh, we are going to have another one of those events in September, but July will be the full ecosystem, as we call it here. Uh, again, come on up front. So first and foremost, I'd like to thank our sponsors. So is there anybody from Lapata Flegel here? I know Mike was out of town. He did the name badges. Uh, Parkside, Dave Schmid. Oh, hi, how are you? Welcome. Uh, Atomic, anyone from Atomic Revenue here? Uh, we got Jason over here from Swift Systems running the camera system. Uh, Tom from Black Twig, where are you at, buddy? Here we go. Uh, Jamie from CMA, I saw you. Hi, Jamie. Uh, Paul from Polsonelli, or anyone from Polsonelli? All right, no worries. And then Matt, Scarin, Scarin Insurance. All right, if we could, let's have a round of applause for our sponsors, please. Without them, the event wouldn't be possible. So the seats you're sitting in, the coffee you're drinking, the, ba the bagel that you're eating, everything, uh, it's all up to them for taking care of everything. So thanks for them. There is a table in the back that has some information. Please grab it on your way out. There's some interesting blog posts, interesting material, marketing material, things along those lines. So please do help support our sponsors. So we've got a fantastic speaker here today, but before we get started, I see a lot of new faces in the crowd, a lot of familiar faces. Uh, we are also online. We're nearing 10,000 people in the MML online group. So if you haven't been able to join online, there's cards in the middle of your table. You can grab those. Please help us get over that 10,000 mark. We were recently invited into the LinkedIn Inner Circle program where we're celebrated as one of the best run uh, groups on LinkedIn worldwide, which was kind of a, a cool feather in our hat. So we're proud to announce that. Thank you. But uh, some of you, I, I, I think you can think back to Queenie Park, I think it was, about 12 years ago where we had the first event. We've had probably about 20 or 30 people in the room there, and uh, the, the community has continued to grow from there. So we're both on these events. Uh, we do it six times a year, odd months, second Friday and we're online, so please feel free to join us however, and there's ways to connect on the, on the card in the middle. So thanks again for being here. I'm going to turn it over to one of my sponsors, our sponsors, uh, Tom Gaddy from Black Twig, and he's gonna introduce our speaker. Thank you. So before I introduce Grant, um, I will say that I'm, I am with Black Twig, one of the partners. Uh, we've been around for about 30 years, 30 years, eight, 18 years. I wanna be 30 years. Um, the one thing that I, I want to kind of give you a background on Grant before I say his stuff is that years ago, about, about 1994, I was on a flight going to Atlanta and I was heading to a corporate meeting and, you know, we were going to a big, big deal June, late June and I get on and the CEO of our company was sitting in, not first class, but in coach. Um, he was the only person I've ever really met in person that was actually a billionaire. At that time, I don't know if he was actually a billionaire, but he was really close. Um, he died a billionaire and, and left all of his art to um, a museum in London. So when I sat there, and I, I, I'm, back in the day you didn't have Southwest, so you could sit in a specific seat. I sat back there and I, I was like, man, I really want to sit next to Spencer and find out a little bit more about him. And we get ready to take off, and I got up and I saw oh, that Spencer's seat was open next to him, and I said, do you mind if I sit? And he said, no, go ahead. And I figured that a, a guy that was a billionaire might be able to give me some advice on business, right? Um, that I might actually learn something. So, you know, the one thing that he told me, and it, it relates to where Grant and I, how Grant and I met, um, he, Spencer Hayes said, and, and by the way, Spencer, um, ended up building the largest manufacturing facilities for 
uh, custom suits and in the organ and basically in the apparel business, uh, individualized apparel group out of New York now. Um, so if you're wearing a custom suit, custom shirt, um, you're wearing almost anything that's even ready-made, he's, he's done it. He told me three things. Surround yourself with people that are much smarter than you because you'll learn more every day. Um, he also told me as a salesman, when you're done for the day, make one more call because that's the call that's going to actually turn into something. And the third thing that he told me, which was, I mean, I live this daily, you know, and, and it's hard to do it, but Spencer lived it daily, and I'll tell you that too, but Spencer said to me, never, ever, ever, ever not take a call because the person on the other end might have something that you might need and you just don't know it until you pick up the phone. So be nice to everybody, pick up the phone, say hello, you can spend 30 seconds and say thank you very much, I don't need your help, or it might turn into something. So I used it on him, by the way, after I started, we were at Black Twig, I called and I left Spencer a message and I'll be darned, next morning at 7.30, I get a call from Spencer, Tom Gaddy, yes, this is Spencer Hayes, what can I do for you? And, and 30 seconds, I had 30 seconds, I know Spencer. I said, I want to tell you about Black Twig, our marketing services, and I want to help you. Okay, I'm going to turn you over to, <laughs> to my CE, our CEO. And I think about a month later, we were in New York. We closed the deal, and we worked with uh, Tom James, the custom apparel group, for probably 18 months, not, uh, two years maybe, and then got us into a couple of other things. So, why does that mean anything about Grant? because I always take phone calls. And uh, Robert, who's with him today, Robert had been hounding me nicely about what they do. And he called and called, and I finally said, okay, let's have a meeting. And when they met with me on the phone, at least, I was more intrigued. And uh, it, it lent itself to having another meeting, a virtual meeting with Grant, uh, with, with Robert, and this is why he's here today, because some of the things that he does is pretty amazing, which uh, I'll be really brief now, because I really have to move on this. Uh, Grant is a professional, uh, he got his professional start in mergers and acquisitions, working on his first legal side, then buy side analysis, valuations, and transition management. After roughly a decade of analyzing valuation and transitioning hundreds of small and mid-market mid businesses, he became infatuated uh, with market research, something that he had uh, worked with every day. Grant determined that while valuable, almost all market research failed to address one simple yet critical question that he needed to answer for his clients. Why are people buying this product or service from your business? With an MBA emphasis in qualitative research marketing, Grant spent the next several years experimenting with methodologies and measurement techniques that could be used to discover the emotions and motivations behind purchasing intent. After working with a nationally renowned brand and analyst, Grant discovered a quantitative method that could be used to assess brand preferences. With that as his starting point, he and his team utilized some principles of neuroscience and behavioral economics and created a new met metadata system that can accurately quantify emotional resonance. Today, Proof uh, has executed over 500 market research engagements using its emotional resonance method. It stands as one of the most novel, compelling, and accurate ways to quantify and understand why customers do the things they do. Grant is an international speaker in emotional market research and emotional data, which is an emerging field that Proof is helping to pioneer. Uh, one nerdy fact about him, which I didn't know this, Grant is basically a, tra is a classically trained vocalist. Are you going to sing? Absolutely. No, okay. All right. Who has performed in venues worldwide, including Carnegie Hall, Westminster Abbey, and St. Mark's Basilica. He has three amazing children with his wife, Stacy, of over three years. So without further ado, Grant. Thank you, Tom. I always appreciate when, when people clap before you come up because. Um, you really know how, have no idea how this is going to go. So, and you can't take the clap back, so I'm going to take it now. Did you guys get all that? And there's not going to be a quiz or anything later, but I figure no one cares about that nonsense. 
Uh, but thank you for having me, Tom. Tom, uh, thank you so much for uh, the hospitality. What a great group. I've had a chance to meet a lot of you. Um, I've been debating something since I've been here this morning. Um, Matt on our, on our team, he, he does all of our design work. And I think the picture up there looks a little smug. <laughs> now, he's been known to prank me by putting stuff in presentations. Does it look smug? I don't really use that picture anywhere. I'm not even sure where he got it. But it looks a little smug. Change it. It's fine? All right. Um, so today we're going to talk a little bit about neuroscience. Just shocks the hell out of me as why everybody's here. We have, thank you, we have locked the doors. So now you're stuck. Um, this is kind of my background. It's a little weird. Anybody else have a weird background? Non-linear? No idea what the hell you're doing? I worked in law. I hated it. Any lawyers here? Oh, it's a great room. Okay. So which one of you is a lawyer that was afraid to raise your hand? And we know. We know. There's one. I knew you were here. Um, yeah, I, I worked in law, but I was really, really good at, at business. It just kind of makes sense, right? I think that's one of the important things in life. Find the thing that you do that takes no effort at all. It just makes sense to me. And um, But when you are dealing with business, you have to deal with a lot of unknowns. Anybody here in sales? We're going to talk about sales today quite a bit. Yeah, salespeople are raising a damn hand, I'll tell you that. So um, uh, there's a very interesting characteristic about being in sales, and, and that is... Um, how honest and truthful all of the people are that you talk to every day, right? Hell no. You are being lied to every minute of every day by every person that you talk to. Yes? yes. This is a fact, right? Now, we're also in the Midwest, so there's like Midwest nice lies. There's also like little white lies. Um, um, Americans lie more than any other culture. Did we know this? Most of the time, it's to satisfy some elements of our social brain, but um, when you're dealing with sales or sales leadership, um, I was telling Mark about this earlier. Mark, Matt, um, you're, be you're dealing with bad data, and so often we see organizations take, take, oh, well, I was talking to this client and this client, and they said this, and they take that back to leadership, and then they turn that into a strategy, and then they implement it. This is how organizations get stuck and start implementing bad uh, strategies and tactics. So um, this was something we had to constantly deal with in the mergers and acquisitions space. And I was obsessed with figuring out how to get past lying. And uh, we came up with a really great sound quantitative methodology. And so I'm going to share a couple of things with you today. One, a little bit of neuroscience around how the brain works, how you can use that in sales capacities, environments, you can use this on your kids, you can use it on your wife, I don't. <laughs> you can use it on colleagues, um, it's not really anything deceitful, it's really just more understanding how human beings operate so that you can be more effective with your communication. And then I'm going to show you some really ornery stuff that we can do on the back end to help you make, sorry, anybody like making money? Uh, show of hands, by a round of applause, who likes making money? And we have a few people in the wrong room. Okay, uh, if you don't like making money, um, you're in the wrong business, which is business. So this is the environment that I live in all the time, okay? This room right here. Uh, unfortunately, yes, it is in boardrooms, which is where I spend the majority of my time. How many of you have been in this room right here? Somebody tell me what's happening in this room right now. There's no wrong answers. Well, there might be. I'll tell you if, I'll tell you if you're wrong. But so, tell me what's going on here. Yes, Beth. The people who have a certain expertise are saying that their expertise is what's going to solve the problem. Yeah, don't be too, don't be too, maybe they're experts. They got opinions, right? <laughs> right? Yeah? yeah? Misalignment. Misalignment. Now, here's... This looks like conflict. It looks like confusion. This happens in every one of your board meetings, um, in every one of your leadership meetings, in every one of your sales meetings. Everybody has an idea, and we're a little bit passionate about our own ideas because we're humans. 
So we think our idea is right. Now, typically, the winning idea is either the highest paid opinion in the room or the person who does a really, really good job selling it. The good news is, is that's typically the right one, right? See, all these people are all doing the exact same thing. They're trying to win. They just want to win, like everybody else. They're trying to make money. They're doing their best, and they're, they have an idea, and they're passionate about it. Here's the problem. They're all right. None of these ideas are wrong. It's just some of them are really going to work, and some of them aren't. This is what makes business really hard. Even when you have great people, there's no way to decipher one way or the other who's right and who's wrong, right, relatively. Who's more right? Which of these ideas is going to make us a 4x return, and which of these ideas is going to make us a 0.2x return? Big difference between those two things, right? So um, we, have a, we have an interesting way that can help us figure this kind of stuff out. Huh, I didn't even know that feature was on there. Look at that. All right, it's not even working. Um, Well, anyway, um, that was a description of our company. Uh, it's called Proof Positioning. Essentially, we are a market research company, and all we do all day long is one thing. We do a very specific kind of study to help organizations understand how to say the right things to the right people. And if you're not interested in that, then you hate money and you're not paying attention. We've done over 500 studies to date, which in the world of market research might as well be a bajillion. Most people in market research capacity won't ever touch that in their lifetime. Uh, we specialize in doing very small, very quick studies that help organizations figure out things quickly. Okay, non like a long, non longitudinal studies. Somebody write that down. Nobody cares. Um, uh, we have hundreds and hundreds of clients. Blah blah blah. Here is. A few, we just picked a handful of like kind of local Midwest based manufacturing companies, everything from all over the board from play sets to technology for the FBI, food, the best t-shirts in the country. Thank you, our local Charlie Hustle friends. Um, so we've worked with lots and lots of different types of organizations in the, man in the manufacturing space. Um, now, one of the things that I want to I teach you is a little bit of how the brain works. There are a few very specific things about the natural processes of how the brain works that you need to know for your everyday life, but particularly for marketing and sales. And the first place I'm going to start is with this dude, Jean Piaget. This is my favorite picture of him. Uh, he, he, um, he's, been, he's passed away for about 50 years. Uh, but he, he was an epistemologist, which is the study of knowledge. How is that a job? Uh, but it is. And he came up with a very, a very few incredibly important things around psychology. So if you took psych psychology in college, he was in your Psych 101 stuff. He's uh, a very important person. And he taught us some, uh, some, some very critical things about how the brain works. One of them is schemas, OK? Now, schemas are essentially shortcuts. Now, your brain is actually the second laziest organ in your body. Behind what? What's the laziest organ in the body? Skin. Skin. One of the most active. It's the appendix, people. It's the appendix. Homeboy back there got it. Um, so the brain cr hates to work. It has a very, very familiar uh, characteristic with water, which is what? Don't, take, don't say take the shape of a container because you didn't think about it. What else? What's a characteristic of water? Conducts electricity. You're, you're correct. I mean, I'm not going to say you're not wrong, but that's not the right answer. What? Thank you. It finds the path of least resistance. This is an important sales tool. If you are talking to someone and you're making their brain work, you are failing. The brain hates to work. 
It despises it. It will do whatever it can to not work. You ever driven home from the office and the next thing you know you were home? Your brain creates shortcuts for everything that you do. Everything. Walking, breathing, and all these things are happening without you realizing them. Your brain will do the same thing when you're having a networking conversation. We're going to talk about objectivity in a second. It'll make some folks real uncomfortable. But schemas are important because it's a, it's, a, it's a very critical mental construct that allows you to cheat if you use it correctly. Now, one of the things um, that we need to make sure and understand is schematic marking. Now, I want you to imagine in your head a timeline. Imagine the timeline of the United States if you were at a museum, for instance, right? Certain things are significant and certain things are not. Like, for instance, the, uh, there may be a little small hash for the birth of Abraham Lincoln, but certainly the death of Abraham Lincoln is much more significant. Agree? Your brain operates in a very similar way. There are, there are specific moments, typically that have strong emotional resonance, that you're, you will remember with great detail. So these are things like the death of a family member, birth of a child, the day you're married, uh, being in a car accident. Things that have trauma or strong emotional resonance, you are, um, your brain will remember with very, very strong detail. You can also take advantage of this if you are a salesperson or an organization, if you are communicating a brand uh, to a marketplace, okay? You want to be a mental schema if you can figure it out, if you can do it. Fair enough? Or be a schematic marker. Make sense? This is all going to wrap, this is all going to come together uh, in a second. Is there any noisy thing about technology here? Like, how come this button doesn't work? Um, so, uh, let's see, is anybody here under the age of 30? Anybody under the age of 30? A file cabinet is a big metal box. And uh, so um, a file cabinet is, is a significant illustration for uh, something that's, that's incredibly important. It's the difference between objectivity and subjectivity. So imagine that you are uh, sitting down at a totally random person's um, uh, file cabinet and you pull the handle out. Where do your eyes immediately go? Old people, this is where you shine. <laughs> where do your eyes go? The labels. What kinds of things are written on the labels? Categories. Categor Who said categories? That was like incredibly the correct answer. Um, yeah, categories, right? Like so, names, client names, taxes. What do all these things have in common? Does anybody have a file for favorite clients? What about friendly clients? The reason that you don't is because it's not organized. Your brain operates in almost the exact same way that, you, that a file cabinet operates. There are things written on tabs and they must be objective. Okay, so difference between objectivity and subjectivity is very simple. Objective things are, does anybody know? Who can give me a good definition? You guys have been doing pretty good so far. Factual, measurable. Factual, measurable, very good. A uh, little more simplistic than that, I would say, you're correct. Uh, the way I like to think about it is, it's the same in everybody's head. Uh, subjectivity, is very different. The, the idea of expensive is different in, in everybody in this room. Uh, friendly is different, right? Good. All of these words that your expository writing teacher in high school told you were important, they're garbage. Don't use them. Subjectivity is the killer of communication and sales. Objectivity is absolutely crucial. And um, you will actually engage in the process of objectivity without you realizing it, and some of you did it today. Who has a, um, uh, who's got a, like a, a, an elevator pitch? Oh, I thought you said you were all salespeople, you freaking liars. You all have elevator pitches. 
And you're, and, and, right? Um, and how many people are like, they've worked on it, like it's 30 seconds, it's okay, it's all right, your sales, like, we're okay. Um, first of all, I'm gonna show you some data a little bit later that's gonna make you ex exceedingly uncomfortable. But all of you have sat through a, um, uh, a, a, an elevator pitch and you didn't know what was going on, right? Maybe not today, not in any, not in any of you, but you have. And uh, you will engage in the process of objectivity, showing you that your brain is working when you are sitting through one of these very bad pitches. And at the end of it, you'll go, so you sell insurance to people with boats? I mean, I, I, mean, I guess technically, but clearly you weren't listening to all the crappy, subjective, confusing language that I was giving you because I think it needs to be colorful and fancy pants for you to understand it, but in actuality, you didn't capture any of it. So you had to insult me by saying that I sell insurance to people with boats. Your brain has to write something on a tab. And if there's nothing on the tab, you will be forgotten Instantly, right? You, you, will be, you will be gone in the ether of someone's brain. If you are not objective in describing what it is you do, you are failing. Even if it's something as stupid as communicating your category. I tell people we do market research. Do I like saying that? No. It's like so much cooler, which is what everybody thinks about their own business. We don't do managed services. Ugh. It's so much cooler. Like, let me just tell you, right? But if you don't tell them at least that we do managed services, let me tell you something intriguing about managed services. And if you don't do that, no one will remember you. Make sense? Emotions. Who takes into consideration emotions when they're in their pitches? We have one, one dude in the back. Here's why you should, because of that guy right there. Now, that's actually not what Antonio Damasio looks like. I just had chat GPT generate a picture of a neuroscientist, and like that dude looks exactly like a neuroscientist. Um, so Antonio Damasio, 25 years ago, got very lucky. He was studying a group of people that had had their limbic systems disabled, particularly their pituitary glands because of head trauma, okay? So what emotions really are, are a series of synopsis firing, and then your brain, your pituitary glands release a neurotoxin into your body, particularly into your spine, like uh, uh, serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine, we've heard these words. Th those cocktails essentially create your emotions, and then we gave them names, because we are a weird species. But essentially, that is what an emotion is. It is a physical reaction to some kind of stimulus. Now, what this guy discovered accidentally when he was studying people that were unable to have emotions, okay? We know left brain, right brain, right? I mean, reasonably, we understand. There's like logic. This is kind of sort of true. But there's a more important dichotomy that's happening. And it's the frontal lobe and the limbic system. The frontal lobe is where all the smart stuff happens, okay? That's uh, engineering, mathematics, any complex detail orientation, anything your brain is doing that's complicated, this fellow right here is being activated. Now it's being activated by the limbic system. The limbic system is responsible for your beliefs, your emotions, and your sort of social interactions, okay? Now what Damasio discovered accidentally, by studying people that were only allowed to use this part of the brain, is they were unable to make even the most simplistic decisions. He discovered it when he brought breakfast down to people when they were at the institute and they were studying him and one day they forgot. And so he passed a clipboard around. He said, just write down your name and what you want. It's always the same stuff we get every time. It's a bagel or right, whatever. And no one could decide. What followed he called endless logical deliberation. They're not able to make a decision. This fellow right here is an options processor. That's it. Salespeople in the room, have you ever been told I got to think about it? That means, you, that, means the, that means the damn sales closed, right? 
That's what that means. I got to think about it means closed, right? Anybody says, I got to think about it, take them out of your funnel. You will not make the sale. What Demacio figured out was that we're kind of proving what a lot of salespeople intuitively have known for years, and that is if someone has to think about something, they're not going to make the sale. And the reason is because this fellow right here, its only job is to process options. God forbid this building catches on fire and none of us are allowed to use uh, our limbic system. We're only allowed to use a smart part of our brain. What happens? We all burn to death. The fact of the matter is, really, really smart stuff. Tell me how managed services work. The fellow back here, ooh, I like ice cream. That th that's the guy that's in charge. If you are not speaking to the dumb, dumb ice cream brain, you ain't closing the deal. So finding a way to make what you do emotional is not just a clever, interesting sales trick. It is a physiological, crucial element to what you have to do in order to make money. This is important in sales, it's important in marketing, and it's important in communication. Most people communicate to the wrong parts of the brain, okay? The, the only two I really care about in this instance, the frontal lobe, the amygdala, and the limbic system, okay? Most people talk to um, the wrong fella. Now, our complex brain also associated in many ways with our ego. That's why we say smart stuff, so that people think we're smart and important. So a lot of times our sales messages are generated to that as well. Let me talk to you about a bunch of smart crap. And because I'm gonna to talk to you, to you about a bunch of smart crap, you are gonna think that I am competent and therefore mathematically increase my probability of getting you to hire me because you, sh you are gonna hire people that are smart. How many of you have a competitor that you hate? Well, what's their name? <laughs> you probably say things like, you know those, they say that they take care of the customer, but they don't. We do. We're actually competent. We do the right thing. We actually do the thing. They don't even do it. Then how come they're gaining market share? Irrelevant. And what we do is we talk to the wrong part of the brain and we do it all the time and you are genetically, in many ways, genetically predisposed to wanting to talk to that part of the brain. You got to keep it simple. Keep it simple, make it emotional, talk to the amygdala, talk about ice cream. What many of you don't know, some really, really good salespeople figure out at the end of the day, no one cares. No one gives a crap about how it works. They don't care how you do it. They don't care what you do. All of it is absolutely irrelevant. The only thing that matters is how do they feel when you're done with it. And if you can't figure out how they feel when you're done and what's gonna drive the emotional resonance around that, none of it matters. If you're in an engineering field, like it, if you're a deductive reasoner, you're a math or engineering brain, I cannot tell you the number of CEOs, especially in engineering fields, who are like, Grant, 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 no, no, no. If they just know how it works, they'll buy it. Nothing could be further from the truth. Nobody cares. Fair? All right. Let's talk about decision making. Who has an elevator pitch that's less than 30 seconds? Yeah, you'll own this one. Good. How long is it? 10, Ten minutes? <laughs> seconds. 10 seconds? That's, re that's really good. Who thinks 10 seconds is about the right length of time for, a, for an elevator pitch? I agree. About 10 seconds. If you can do it in 10 seconds, you got yourself figured out. If it takes more than 10 seconds, do they care? They're not going to sit there and listen to you. How long do we all think it takes 
for a human being to make a decision. Who thinks they know? Tom's got his hand up. What's up, brother? 60 seconds for a human to make a decision. Close. Well, who said one second? Get it together. <laughs> one second. 30 seconds? A little more reasonable. Anybody know who this dude is? He's a father of behavioral economics. Does anybody know or familiar with behavioral economics? Dog. Behavioral econ is one of the coolest things ever. Uh, He's a psychologist and an economist, which is a really bizarre combo. And we just lost him a couple years ago, but won the Nobel Prize, completely brilliant. Behavioral economics is uh, the annoying stuff in life that controls your behavior without you knowing it, like charging $1.99 instead of $2, and the number of people that buy it goes up by 30%. You should look into behavioral economics if you like money, because it's awesome. So Kahneman wins the Nobel Prize, he works with Johns Hopkins, because Johns Hopkins are the, is the best at hooking people up to machines um, as far as studying the brain. And one of the things they were, uh, so he wrote a book called Thinking Fast and Slow. Some people have heard of this book. Uh, some people have read it. If you've read it, it is a really, really tough read. I don't recommend it. Uh, but that's all right. There are summaries everywhere. Um, so what he discovers is that there's something really interesting around going through my entire slides in one hit. So one of the things that they were able to figure out is that they were able to quantify pretty accurately how long it takes somebody to make a decision. I heard 30 seconds, I heard 60 seconds, I heard one second, five seconds. Yeah, we're all not even close. The number is 200 milliseconds. Do you may know why? Somebody gets this, you'll earn my respect. Why would our brain act that quickly? Survival. Survival, correct. That's exactly right. It's not because it like, ooh, I want to be super efficient. Remember how lazy it is? Our brain's only job really is to keep us alive. So the reason it takes 200 milliseconds is because that might be, to, might be a lion in the bushes. Got me? So does that mean how you look matters? Now I'm a researcher. I get asked all the time by people that don't know what they're talking about to find an unbiased sample. These are typically academics. Did you get an unbiased sample? Yes. Yes, of course I was able to get an unbiased sample. They're people, they're living in caves, and they're everywhere. We are an unbelievably biased species. We have no choice. As a for example, let's say, that, um, let's say that we are having lunch today, right? And we went and had spaghetti, and I started eating with my hands. And then I made a restaurant recommendation to you. Now, you know nothing about this restaurant that I recommended, but what do you know? Probably not freaking good because a weirdo over here, right? Now, you know nothing about this restaurant, but I've already biased you, okay? So this means how you look reflects your business, how you carry yourself. And the first impression thing, dramatically underestimated. It is all critically important, okay? And the really sad thing is, it takes about 400 milliseconds for the concrete to dry after the brain makes a decision. Now this not only happens with, with visually, but it also happens if you give someone a value proposition. So you see an ad that pops up, or you're, you're uh, listening to a talk, or you're um, uh, giving a sales pitch. All of these things happen instantaneously. You will only go into what's called consideration 200 milliseconds after uh, your initial 600 milliseconds before the concrete dries in your brain. That means in less than one second, your brain has gone through three critical processes in order to concrete a decision. And it all happens back in the dumb, dumb ice cream brain. What Kahneman showed us is that 
System one, which is our limbic system, operates incredibly quickly. System two, incredibly slowly. So that was really interesting for us as a learning. But I wanted to give you some of this stuff today uh, as, as very basic takeaways when you're dealing in your, in your daily life, okay? Here are some very simple rules. Be objective. If you're using subjective language, you are losing, right? So this comes to value propositions. The worst value propositions in the world use words like quality, customer service, and trust. If you're using any of those three words, you should be, I should, well, if you are, I just released a neurotoxin into your spine called norepinephrine, and it's a kind of a stress chemical, and I don't like feeling that good, right? But if you are using those words, you are losing money. They're not even real words. They don't mean anything. What does customer service mean? Nothing. It is a lazy amalgamation of actual things that matter to people. So one of the things I want you to think about when you're talking about your value propositions is what they actually mean. Because customer service is nonsense. But what, but what is important is giving all, of your sales, giving all of your customers the cell phone numbers of your salespeople. Being able to be in contact 24 hours, seven days a week. You can text us and we will be, in back, we will be back with you in less than two minutes. These are valuable things to customers. And they essentially, we call them value proposition units. They actually do make up the idea of customer service quality. We got a good quality product. We got a good quality product. What the hell does that mean? Now, it actually does mean something. You just refuse to tell them what it is. You've got to think about, follow these rules. Is it objective? How about we have the lowest failure rate per thousand units of anybody in our industry? That's a real thing. That is a value proposition unit of quality. So change the way you're thinking about how you're communicating. Don't use marketing language. Marketing, the brain does not like marketing language. The fancier the communication, the less effective it is. Keep it simple. Keep it objective. Make sure that we're making emotional appeals. Avoid talking to the smart brain. Talk to the dumb brain. And your world's gonna be easier. Fair enough? Do you wanna see how we use this type of information to help you make money? I asked Tom. I said, Tom, what do you want me to talk about? He goes, he goes, grand people like making money. If you can help them do that, they'll be happy. That's very good. So when I was studying this stuff, uh, I was, at the time I was working in mergers and acquisitions as an analyst. And I had to work with market research all the time. And I hated it because it was nonsense. Anybody here ever like done market research or had a market research report or anything like that? We've got some personas. We've got the cowboy. We've got the, the you know, religious giver. Uh, these things make us feel better typically, but most of the time, well, I'll tell you, the biggest complaint we get for people that, that use market research is they don't know how to turn it into money. And if you don't know how to turn it into money, what the hell is the point? So um, these three guys that I talked about, Jean Piaget, Daniel Kahneman, and Antonio Damasio, were the foundations behind a system that we wanted to build. And we built a metadata system. Now, we also needed to have a Venn diagram because if you don't have a Venn diagram, you have no street cred. So we made sure and had to put that together so that it was on a presentation. Anybody here not have a Venn diagram in your presentation? Get it together, people. Um, so what we did is we created a metadata system that calculates, using all three of these ideas, timing, extreme scoring Likert analysis, write that down, right? Um, and, uh, uh, and, and making sure that we're using um, uh, uh, our emotional concept testing, which is that exercise I just took you through really briefly around like, you can't say quality, you have to come up with an objective, explicit value proposition. And we built a survey mechanism around it. So what I needed to do is figure out how can I build, how can I scalably go out to an audience and find out what's important to them? Make sense? All right, um, so how do we do this? Um, it's actually pretty simple. 
Uh, the, the two reasons that we typically are engaged is we're trying to help somebody make a better decision about something. Typically that's because we've tried a bunch of things and they haven't worked, or we're just extremely interested in making more money. So um, I took an example of a manufacturing company because this is a manufacturing event, I thought that would be smart. So um, this, is a, uh, this is a large uh, uh, lighting manufacturer, okay? And they engage us to do several things. They have, a, they have a direct to consumer side of their business and they also have a B2B side. Anybody else have that B2B, B2C model as well? No manufacturer here is B2B and B2C? B2B only? We got one, is anybody B2B only? Wait, 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 wait. How many businesses in here sell to other businesses? That's what B2B means, okay. So everybody. I was like, what the hell kind of, all right. So one of the things that they wanted us to do is figure out, okay, so over COVID, they really hyper invested in customer service, okay? Now they're way over leveraged. And it was a really smart move for them because they were able to retain a lot of their customers. Um, and uh, the type of lighting they sell, it can be kind of, uh, a lot of it's like landscaping stuff, and so it can be really confusing. So their customer service department did really, really well, but now they're over leveraged, they wanted to free up some working capital. And they said, before we lay off all these people, can you tell us how important it is? So if you look here, how come nobody's writing these numbers down? No, I'm just kidding. Um, so, the two most important value props in this simple thing, uh, in this simple analysis we did, told us that, that customer service is incredibly important. See how those are not, like, you have a dedicated human being and you will answer my call 24-7. The two most important things, the bottom thing there was something the marketing department was really excited to do. And I said, you can do that if you want, if you hate money, it's not going to work. But I said, you got bad news, unfortunately. You can lay some of these people off, but be extremely careful if you do it because this is incredibly important to your customers. So if you do that, you should expect attrition. This is a bad business move. It doesn't look like it because it looks like you're freeing up work, you're freeing up labor cost to increase working capital to grow. But it's a bad decision. And they were extremely relieved when we told them that uh, because it saved them a lot of money. So afterwards, they asked us if we could come in and, and uh, identify where they should be focused on their distribution network, ask them where they should be focusing um, uh, as far as industry is concerned, right? There were five major industries that they were invested in and they said, hey, weird guy, can you figure out how, like, where we should be putting a lot of our assets and our human capital and dollars? We said, sure. Now we're gonna do this together. and make it easy on you. Can you guys see? You probably can't. Um, all I know is uh, there's five, just worry about the five columns, the first five columns. Which columns should they be focusing on? Retail. Right, you can see retail. Retail, yes. What else? Their manufacturing sectors, that's the first one. Where should they be divesting? Whatever well, that red column is, right? All we're doing is showing them simple emotional resonance. So yes, you are correct, good job. Now this is what the slide actually looked like, but, um, but, you, but the major premises stay the same. If you invest in banking and financial, what you can expect is very simple. Less return for every dollar that you put into that market and every hour of human capital that you spend. I said, go back and look at your, they were using Salesforce, go back and look at your Salesforce and pull these KPIs. Revenue per opportunity, uh, time to close, and salesperson turnover. And I said, what you're gonna find there is there's a very high probability that all of those KPIs are gonna be worse than in any other part of your business, and they were. How did you do that? Like, not the smartest. We just have a really, really good tool to help guide you. You see those two reds, those two lo lo isolated red dots? Um, I, in the back, you can't see those. But what the concept is, is has the lowest price. So if it's green, that means having the lowest price is more important to those two industry sectors. Who wants to work and sell into a sector where price 
is important. Hands? We all do. want to attract customers, right? Only if I'm the low cost producer. Who wants to be the low cost producer? If you want to, if, I'll tell you what, if they said, Grant, congratulations, that fourth column with the 49 right here is healthcare, substantial over residence. They said, Grant, congratulations, you are now in charge of our healthcare division. I would say, great, here's my two weeks. I said, go look, you're gonna get, go look at your sales force. You're gonna get beat up on price. You're gonna get asked after the deal is done to decrease your price. You're gonna be in more bidding situations. Anytime price is elevated in any part of your business, you are losing money. So I recommended manufacturing and retail. If you focus on those two industry sectors, you should expect to maximize the amount of money you are making for every dollar you invest and every hour of human capital you invest in those two, in those two areas. What happened when they did that? Well, they didn't come out of banking. So they said, well, what if we just get rid of banking altogether? I said, don't, don't, don't do that. Just don't invest. Don't invest. It's millions of dollars. Don't, don't, just don't invest in it. The next quarter, just by redirecting salespeople, they made an additional $4 million in business just by focusing in the right areas. This is not complicated stuff if you have the right information. Anybody here in a marketing capacity or communications capacity? I'm responsible for targeting individuals and saying important things to them. Everybody's hand should be in the air because it doesn't matter if you're a, a salesperson in marketing or leadership, you have to know this. Uh, this is the last slide I'll show you. It's a bunch of gobbledygook. I don't expect you to understand it. Here's my point. Any, any type of communication that you have as an organization can be important to someone. But if you want to understand how to be responsible and effective around communicating, you must understand what the emotional drivers are behind those people. Sometimes you can make it really easy. The columns here are CEO, CFO, COO, VP, purchasing. So if you're putting together a campaign, whether it's a marketing campaign or an email campaign or a digital campaign, if you know this information, it's cheating. It's cheating. What we have here is the most mathematically efficient content program that probably exists, well, that does exist for this company to be certain, but probably, I would say, in the manufacturing space, that slide right there is not going to be universally correct, but it's probably the most effective communication strategy you can, you can gear towards the CE, a CEO or a CFO of a distribution company that exists. And it's not because we're any smarter than anybody else. We have a really, really great tool. How does this work? It's pretty simple. All you have to do is figure out what's important to you. And that's what I'm going to talk about. To, that's what I'm going to finish with today. Um, there's something that we use called burning questions. Not very clever. But it's one of the most effective exercises you could go through as an organization. And that is, what are the things that are driving you nuts? A lot of times, when you're operating in your executive capacity, you have to solve tactical, simple problems. And very rarely do you ever step back and say, what's really driving me nuts? The things that are driving you nuts are the things that are gonna make you your next million dollars, not your next thousand, which is what your tactical problems and your directors and people underneath you should be working on. So I want you to think about those things. Now, every year we release an annual report on all the industries that we work in, uh, depending on the frequency of volume we have for that year, and we release the top burning questions that we work with. We have to have at least 100 burning questions for, it to, uh, for us to release this. These are the top six burning questions in the manufacturing space. So I'm just guessing all of these things are gonna hit home at least a little bit if you are in the manufacturing space. Now I know a lot of you are service providers to manufacturers and not gonna be as relevant, but if you are a manufacturer, you want to know those things. If you are not a manufacturer, do you know what Socratic method is? Um, do you know what Sandler is? Sandler is essentially Socratic method. If you're a salesperson and you use Sandler, 
these are the six questions you should probably be asking your customers if they're in the manufacturing space and you're interested in making money. So I want you to uh, use this as a starting point, flip your paper over, and I want you to write down three things that are driving you nuts. And I'm gonna leave you, I'm gonna leave you there today unless we have any questions. Yes, sir. Why do you limit it to manufacturers? They seem relevant to many, many um, we're, at, we're, at, we're at a manufacturing event. So I just made it, I, I made, I tailored this towards manufacturing. Okay, thank you. We've worked with um, almost anything you can think of. Done work for the FBI, ATF, DEA, DOD. Uh, we've done work for distributors, manufacturers, retailers, huge nonprofits, tiny nonprofits. Almost anything you think of. Our two biggest weaknesses are hotels and professional sports teams. Why are those two biggest Say again? Why are those two your biggest I don't know. Per uh, professional sports are hard to break into because they're very sexy. Um, and we don't try to break into them. Um, hotels is actually, there's not that many. Hotels are like food. It's actually not that many brands. They, it's like, it's like four companies own all of the hotels, so it's highly defragmented. That's a good question. Tom, we good? How much time we got? Hey, uh, so uh, if you have any questions, keep going. I'll just say uh, we're going to hang out for a little bit. If you guys want to hang out and chat, we are going to be in town for the next couple of hours. If anybody wants to meet and uh, hang out and pick our brain. We are really nerdy around a lot of stuff. Uh, and because essentially we're economists, it's not based on my opinion most of the time, it's based on something that we've done in your space. So we're happy to hang out. Tom's gonna host, so thank you for doing that, Tom. Yeah, what's up, bud? The color coded tables that you have. Yeah. I think you said it was specific to that business, but that, does that stretch out to any way that's communicated? That's a really good question. So um, we, uh, no, it does not. So this is interesting. For instance, um, we have some very interesting ways to measure commoditization. Um, the most, com actually, see if anybody can guess. What is the most commoditized industry that you think exists? We have a very accurate way to figure it out. Yeah, right there. Jared, oh, it's because Jared's in it. Brother. Uh, it's financial services and banking. Um, especially BRICS banks, you essentially have, you have no you have no differentiating value propositions. Somebody tell me the competitive advantage of a bank. We had nine locations. It doesn't exist, right? Um, it's really, really bad. Uh, so, you, I don't know if you remember, you saw like lowest price was kind of like a little bit lower on that, on that example. What, what happens is, is we can see how commoditized an industry is by where that exists. So if it's really high, that means we know that, that, that price is critically important more than any of the value propositions we're testing and therefore, so there have been times we have to have bad conversations. We had to have one with a, with a distributor just the other day where I was like, ooh, it's tough sled. Um, so, uh, sorry. Um, what we have found, the reason I bring up banks is because banks are the most commoditized and they all think they're typically going after the same people. What we see is banks are very, very homogenous from the outside. What's the difference between first bank and second bank? There is, there's hardly no difference at all. Uh, some banks have reputations based on heredity, um, right, and how long they've been in town and it's like, like, you know, we're from Kansas City and so there are banks that are, you know, it's like, well, that's the bank of the Blue Bloods, right? And, and, and there's kind of those little nuances that exist, but that's essentially it. But what we see is when we analyze the value propositions that are most significant to their customers, we see how the banks are actually different. They just rarely communicate those things um, to, to the outside world. They have the same generic nightmare conversations that just blow by our brains and we never even notice. So um, that's the case with every business. Um, uh, uh, banks is the 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 toughest example, and if we see that there are differences that exist in banking, it exists in every industry. So what we don't release is industry reports, because I know, well first of all, who looks at industry reports? 
If you're not looking at industry reports, you're not paying attention. Who can give me an argument as to why you shouldn't? Yep. It just it's the same crap. So like, why would you want to execute the same thing that all your competitors are doing? There's one really basic rule in marketing. Be different. You don't have to be better at anyone, at anything. The only thing that matters is be different. That's it. It doesn't even have to be relevant. It just has to be different in some way. And that's, I mean, that's, your, that's essentially your golden rule. Yo. NPS? You're talking, about, you're talking about net promoter score? Who here does net promoter score? What do you use it for? Communicating to your customer that you're doing a good job. And who's our promoters? Who should give us, like, give us a referral? Awesome. So what you do is then you identify who those promoters are, reach out to them, and have them refer your business, right? Correct. You actually do that? We do it continuously. So it's not, it's not anonymous? NPS is one of the most ridiculously pointless metrics you can use in an organization. It's completely irrelevant. Sorry. Bain Capital, it's giving me a hard time. Uh, everybody does it. Everybody does it. Um, you know why? Actually, NPS satisfies all the rules I showed you. All they did was take something very complicated, make it incredibly simple, make it incredibly objective, and it's easy to understand. That's it. That's one of the reasons that NPS is so successful. As a metric, it's totally irrelevant. No one, no one even really uses it. Do you know the science behind how, how Bain created that? Just made it up. Just made it up. Its, it's value and the brilliance of it is in its simplicity. And if you're not using it in a way that's effective, who cares? Who cares? Somebody can ask me what's really effective? Just kind of waiting for that follow up. Yes. The answer is absolutely depends. If it wasn't, that'd probably be the wrong answer, right? Because there, no, there is no magic bullet. We are obsessed in business with magic bullets because we hate work, why? absolutely obsessed with magic bullets. They, they do not exist. Once you understand your customer in a way that no one else understands your customer, you will figure out how to make more of them. But until you do that, it's all, you're all shooting in the dark anyway. Anybody else? I'm gonna give it back to Tom and then that's it. Hey, thank you, St. Louis. Thank you all for having us. Appreciate it. That's my cell phone. Nice job. Mm -hmm. awesome. No calls after 10. <laughs> Contact information on screen. All right, one more round of applause, please. Jace, can we get a picture, please? Okay, uh, while we're getting lined up for this, I do want to say Happy Mother's Day. How many mothers are in the room? Happy Mother's Day weekend. Thank you. All right, our standing joke is if you are a convict, escape convict, or you're wanted or anything, just duck your head, because this is going on social media. All right, great, thank you. Okay, so our next event is July 12th. It'll be another one of these big group events, so everyone is welcome. Uh, we are working on several really interesting topics uh, from labor and workforce solutions all the way to private equity and other types of ESOPs and engagements. So we're going to have a panel on that as well. So we got some really good information coming to you still this year. So please come see us again in July. Uh, believe it or not, that's one of our biggest attended events. Uh, I guess everyone's looking for connections during the, the summer months. So uh, please, there's feedback forms on the table. If you haven't seen this one before, there's a new section. If you need help with something, 
What we want to do is we want to connect you there. We're not going to put you on a mailing list. We're not going to spam you to death or anything like that. But it, there's a, a block down there that if you need help with any of those things in your business, we're going to connect you with other people in the room that can help you with those things. And then please fill out the feedback form as well because uh, that helps us see how we're doing and see what you want to hear about next. So please do recycle and throw away your trash. There are recycle bins and trash bins around the room. And uh, throw your name badges into the, the little brown container at the back on your way out. Other than that, thank you for being here. Grant, thank you. Great job. And I hope you all have a wonderful weekend.